Good morning, Athens peeps. Glad you're here. Hearty hello to y'all across camp, uh, across campus, across town, at our Greenville campus. We're glad you're here with us this morning. We're glad you all. I forgot to wait for the claps. Thank you for the reminder. We're glad you're here to study God's word with us together today. Uh, being together as the body of Christ to sing his praises, to sing the praises of God, and to study his word together is important stuff, so we're glad you're here. Today we jump back, as Tommy just said, those of y'all maybe in Greenville, Tyson might have said it, we jump back into our series in the Gospel of John, in John chapter 13, we're going to be doing verses 31 through 38, and today's sermon title is taken from verse 36. You cannot follow me now, Jesus speaking to Peter. You cannot follow me now, but you will. So we've got a lot to get to today, so grab your Bible, follow along on a sermon guide on the app if you've got that handy, and let's review our current memory verses, uh, and then we'll pray and dive in. We'll be reading today's passage at the beginning of the sermon, and we've got a lot of things to look at today, so it's going to be like some old school sword drills from Sunday school or vacation Bible school. So memory verses we've been using in this section of John are from today's passage, John 13, 34 through 35, and we'll say through. So reference first, then the verses all together, John 13, 34 through 35, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. All righty, friends, let's pray and be ready for that corporate amen at the end there. Holy God, we're gathered today because we desperately need the truth and the power of your all-sufficient word to feed and to encourage us. We need your work to do the work in us today. So as we submit ourselves to you and to the lordship of your son Jesus and the work of your Holy Spirit in our lives, we ask that our study together in your scriptures would help us to more deeply love, more clearly see, and to more closely follow Jesus Christ as Master and as Lord. For the sake of your goodness and glory, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. So as we jump back into the Gospel of John, I think it's important for us to do a little bit of review, to, to review a bit of ground that we've covered up to this point, but I want to do so in a way that kind of emerges from and helps us understand today's passage. So we'll start by reading all of John 13, 31 through 38 together, with just a little bit of comment along the way. And then we'll make our way back to John 13 by starting at the beginning of John and end with some application. You'll want to have your sermon guide or your Bible open and ready. It's a little like those old sword drills from Sunday school. We're going to be looking up a lot of passages in John today. So let's read together. John chapter 13, starting at verse 31. When he had gone out, meaning when Judas, the disciple who betrayed Jesus, had left when he'd gone out, and so it was just Jesus and the disciples, when he had gone out, Jesus said, now, now that it's just us, now is the time now is the Son of Man glorified. This is the theme that we'll be tracing in just a few moments here, the glorification of Christ and what is meant by that. We'll see the development of that progressively developing throughout John. Notice that here in verses 31 and 32, Jesus uses the word glory or glorify, some, some way of using the verb glory there, five times in two verses. So it's obviously important to what he's trying to say here. He says, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, 
God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. At once, now, same idea there. Now he says this, verse 33, little children, yet a little while I am with you. I'm about to leave you soon. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, he said this earlier, you'll soon see that this also refers to this theme of glorification. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I'm going to the cross, I'm going back to the Father, and you can't come along. So he says, I go, you stay, which means, verses 34 through 8, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, verse 36, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will crow, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. So let's look at this theme of glorification, the glorification of Christ and what it means. What we see developing from the very beginning of the Gospel of John is that Jesus, if you've been tracking with us through the study or maybe you've read the Gospel of John a few times, Jesus had been predicting his own death. That's probably no great surprise to most of us, but what is surprising is how Jesus speaks about his own death as glorification. His death is glorification, he says. Think about that before we jump in for just a second. (laughs) Death is something that, that we, the disciples, everyone around Jesus at the time, pretty much everyone who has ever lived, death is something that we view as as failure, as the end. But Jesus himself claims that it's not failure, it's not shame, it's not the end, but rather it's glorification, which is a funny way to talk about it. And what we'll see here is that he's making the argument with his own life and with the way he speaks about it throughout, that death is actually how he reveals God the Father and how he saves his own people. It's fascinating. Turn back with me to John chapter 1, starting at verse 14. From the very beginning of John, He makes clear not only that Jesus came to reveal God's glory, but also that Jesus had been hinting about his death as glorification, his death as glory all along. Look at John chapter 1, starting at verse 14. John tells us, and the word, the word there is Jesus. John has already established throughout there that that Jesus was coexistent and and co-creator with God the Father. So the word, Jesus, became flesh became skin and bones and dwelt among us, lived among us, and we have seen his glory. What what is this glory he's talking about? Is it just Jesus being in the flesh, being among us? Or is it also something more? Well, it's more because, (laughs) keep reading right there in 114, that glory is as of the only Son from the Father. As from the Father, full of grace and truth. As coming from Jesus the Son, from the Father, as the fullness and embodiment of God's grace and truth. So John says at the very beginning, we have seen glory that only Jesus has. But how did we see it? What did we see that showed us the glory? At the end of chapter 1, Jesus has just called two disciples to follow him, and he miraculously tells one of them that, that he saw him sitting under the tree. I think it was Nathaniel, not Philip. Saw Nathaniel sitting under the fig tree earlier when nobody else was around to see him, and the disciple hears Jesus tell him that, and he says, wow, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jump down to chapter 1, verse 50, where Jesus answers him, because I said to you, 
I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? And then he says, you will see greater things than these. What greater things will he see? What greater things are we going to see, Jesus? Verse 51, and he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened. Heaven is the fullness of the presence of God. You will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Jesus tells Nathanael and Philip here that what they're going to see in Jesus in his life and in his death is heaven revealed. The glory of God the Father revealed in Christ on whom the angels ascend and descend. In John 3, speaking to Nicodemus, Jesus sort of (laughs) destroys earthly categories, especially for a guy like Nicodemus. He obliterates our earthly categories, and he begins to speak of his own glory in a way that begins to, begins to look like the cross. Start at verse 13 in chapter 3. He says this, No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Speaking of himself. Son of Man was Jesus' favorite way to speak of himself here. He did it a lot in John. And so just like John said in chapter 1, verse 14, just like Jesus said in chapter 1, verse 51, heaven is the glory from which I've come, Jesus says. The fullness of the presence of the Father is the glory that I've come to reveal. And then look at this, John 3, 14. And then he says this, as Moses lifted up the serpent... As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, meaning in the same manner as he lifted up, in the same manner that Moses lifted up a serpent in the wilderness so that the people of God in the Old Testament who were sick could look at it and be healed, they could look up for healing. As Moses lifted up the serpent, so must, in the same way, the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So Jesus, what are we looking up at? (laughs) What are we looking up at? And and, and how are you going to be lifted up like the serpent in the wilderness that Moses held up on a stick, by the way? (laughs) How are you going to be lifted up so that whomever looks up at you will have eternal life? Look at John 7. This is where Jewish officials had sent officers to arrest Jesus And he hints again here at at his own death as being glory by speaking of going back to the Father. Start in verse 33 in chapter 7. Jesus then said, just like he would here with the disciples, I will be with you a little longer, and then I am going to him who sent me. In the context of the discussion, it was clear he was talking about God the Father. You will seek me, you'll look after, look for me, and you will not find me, for where I am uses that phrase, I am, which was the the name by which God revealed himself first to Moses and to the people of God as the one who was and is and is to come, the eternal, all-powerful God, where I am, you cannot come. (laughs) Well, they didn't understand that. So the Jews said to one another, verse 35, where does this man intend to go that, that we will not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks, to go outside of where God's people are, to to the scattered Jews that are living among the Greeks and the Gentiles to teach them? What does he mean by saying, you will seek me and you will not find me? And, And where I am, you cannot come. What does he mean? Where does he mean? Keep reading. Verse 37. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And then John explains it. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. It's becoming a little clearer here. Something having to do with Jesus being glorified had to happen before the Spirit could be given, John tells us. In John 8, right after the Jews asked him, who are you? Jesus says, 
I've been telling you all along from the beginning, but they still didn't understand. So he, he begins to become more pointed and, and clear about what he means here. Look in John chapter 8, verse 28. When Jesus said to them, this is the second of three lifted up sayings in John, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, speaking about himself, then you will know that I am he, and that I am God, and that I do nothing of my own authority, but I speak just as God the Father taught me. So we see glorification, something having to happen before the Spirit comes, coexistence and co-eternality and being in perfect unity with God. All these kinds of themes are happening along the way with this glorification thing and being lifted up. Look at John 11, where it becomes a little more clear that he's talking also about his death. This is when Jesus has raised Lazarus from the dead, and he says this both about Lazarus' death and his own death that was soon to come. Look at uh, John 11, verse 4. He says, this illness, speaking of Lazarus, does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God. Which is funny because the illness had led to death for Lazarus. And yet he says, this illness does not lead to death. This is for the glory of God, so that the Son of Man may be glorified through it, both in his raising of Lazarus from the dead, which was a foretelling of his own being raised from the dead, and when one of Lazarus' own sisters protests and, and, and says, Jesus, he's dead, he's been dead for four days, Jesus tells her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? And then the most explicit in John chapter 12, at the triumphal entry, when the people were praising Jesus as he came into the city of Jerusalem, John tells us in chapter 12, verse 16, his disciples, Jesus' own disciples, did not understand these things at first. They didn't understand what was going on. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered these things had been written about him and had been done to him. And then finally, a few verses from chapter 12 show this glorification of Christ in death in very explicit terms. Look at verse 23, John chapter 12. This is, this is John telling us that the Gentiles the non-Jews were looking after, seeking after Jesus, which was also apparently a sign of Jesus knowing that his time had come. Look at verse 23. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Then he starts talking about death that brings life. Death that brings life. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth, into the soil, and dies... It remains alone. If a seed just sits there, if it doesn't go into the soil and die, it does nothing. Nothing happens with that seed. It just sits there. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. If it dies, things live. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. I thought that we couldn't go where you are going. <laughs> where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Important context here that parallels what we see in our text in John 13. Keep reading, though, verse 27 John chapter 12. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have, I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. 
Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. Jump down to verse 30. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, speaking to those around, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. Notice how Jesus repeats this now thing in our passage. It's imminent. It's happening soon. The glorification that is his death, that would be the death that brings life, is about to happen. And then the third lifted up saying, look at verse 32, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. The death of Christ he knew all along was the opposite of what those around him and of what we would think that it should be. As John all along and Jesus obviously have been telling us, the glory of God is made known in the death of Christ that looks like failure and that looks like the end and that looks like shame and hopes being dashed was what he knew all along would glorify him, take him back to the Father, and would become the death by which his own would be glorified. Notice, Jesus doesn't speak all along about failure and shame, loss, as if his death was going to be those things. He even repeatedly spoke of his own death as a return to the Father in a way that means that he knew his death would not be the end. This doesn't mean that Jesus thought it would be easy, but it does mean he thought of his own death for his people as leading to life for them, just like it would mean his own return to the Father. Now jump into John 13. Some really cool stuff to show, to show you here. This is where Jesus begins a pretty conscious turn toward the cross, starting at verse 31. Look at just the first phrase. It's important to set the tone for us here. Verse 31, John 13 says this, when he had gone out. When he had gone out. We need to understand what's going on here because we as alluded to, as we alluded to earlier, John includes this phrase as a, an intentional literary cue so that we as readers note what's going on. So obviously John is referring here to Judas Iscariot, the the disciple who betrayed Jesus. In fact, in just the preceding context, having just gone out, having just left the scene, John is telling us intentionally to tip us off to this idea that, that Jesus knows what he's doing and what he's about to say comes from this context. Here's how we know. Look back at verse 30 real quick in John chapter 30, where John says that, that he immediately went out. This is the exact same word and same tense in verse 31 that he uses in verse 30 to say that he had gone out. Not only that, and you can't always see this in our English translations, but at the beginning of verse 31, there's a therefore. There's a therefore here at the beginning of verse 31. So John puts that there at the beginning of verse 31 to make clear that that there's a sharp contrast from what came before that makes clear that in the previous scene where Jesus predicts a betrayer and eats with this betrayer, a sharp contrast happens where he begins to, to speak with the disciples. This is important. Think of the context. Because having just announced in the previous scene with the disciples where Judas was there, having just announced in the previous scene that one of those 12 was going to betray him, and having just washed that man's feet, and having actually broken bread with the betrayer, what Jesus says next is said with the recognition that even the betrayal of one of his own and his death would all serve to bring himself and God and God's people glory. 
Keep reading verse 31. When he had gone out, Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. <laughs> There's a lot going on here. Five different ways, five different times this word, this verb glory is used. So in John 10, Jesus had already said, I and the Father are one. We know that in a number of places in John, but, but Jesus had said it, I and the Father are one, meaning they are one and the same in perfect unity, in essence, in purpose. So when something happens to one, it happens to the other. And so there's a mutual glorification that Jesus says is going on here in the cross. And all of that is, is reflected in a whole crazy mixture of those five verbs there that, that use different tenses that are past, <laughs> present, and future, all in that two-verse passage there, in a way that come together that a famous scholar describes as an occurrence started, it started because it, it was back here and it came to here, but it's not yet done, but it's certain of being done, which means Jesus apparently, according to John here, intentionally speaks of his glorification, reflecting his essential character and nature as God, and he says it in a way that means it's already started in the past, his glorification through death, but it's not yet complete, and it's about to happen, but it's not totally done, but it's certain to be completed. It's like saying that the plan of God from eternity past is happening now, but it's not yet done, and it's so certain that its future effects can be experienced in the present. A lot of the Greek nerds and scholars call this the omnitemporal tense. They're just making up that word. It's a way of saying, we don't have words for this. We don't have ways to describe this in our language. But God does, because... Jesus is speaking in mind-blowing and, and category-destroying glory that is beyond time as we know it. It's outside of time as we know it, and yet at the same time, he does it in time so that the benefits of the death of Jesus that are about to take place are available for all who have faith in him as they look up to him, regardless of where they do it or when they do it. That's as much explanation as I can give. <laughs> But that's how it works with a perfect, infinite, timeless, all-powerful, all-present God. So when Jesus says here that the Father is going to glorify him at once, he means it also as now. And some versions of our scriptures say immediately, at once. Glorify him at once, meaning now. Why? Because it's Thursday night and just some 15 hours from here, at 3 p.m. on Friday afternoon, Jesus was going to be hanging on a cross, glorified as he said here, which also means <laughs> that it would be just like predicted in Isaiah 49.3, where Isaiah describes long before that the Father's servant would come to do the Father's will, and the servant reports the Father as looking down at the servant and saying, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Isaiah 49, 3. So Jesus knows at this moment that he was fulfilling the law where the people of God had failed, such that he called it being glorified. Even though no one at the time Jesus said this would have understood this well, and would have understood the Messiah as being glorified in death, Jesus knew. Notice next, between verse 32 and 33, there's a turn in focus. Jesus has just been talking about all these category obliterating ideas that none of them at the time understood. And then he turns to his people. He says this, little children, 
yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, you'll be looking for me, but just as I said to the Jews before, as we read earlier, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. Where I'm going, you cannot come. And yet he would later say, you will come, you will follow, you will die. He says, where I'm going, you cannot come. Which is like when he says, you cannot drink the cup I drink. In the sense that they could, could not themselves die in a glory like he would die so that he could save, so that they could save as he could. Let me say that again. When he says, you cannot drink the cup I drink, he means it in the sense that they could not die in glory as he would die such that it would be effective to save. And yet, they would die. They would drink the cup. Keep reading. A new commandment. John puts that phrase, a new commandment, at the front of the sentence, which makes it what we call emphatic, to put the, the emphasis on it, to make clear that John thinks here that Jesus is saying something really important to his followers. So he says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Which to them must have sounded weird at first because that wasn't new. That was a commandment. They all understood, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Big deal, Jesus. We know. We've been taught that from the very beginning. But he says this, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, not new, but as rabbis often would do, they would repeat the part that they knew, that everyone knew, and then they would extend on it with the new part. And here comes the new part. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, just as in the same manner. He's redefining love for them. In the same manner as I have loved you, and I'm about to love through the death that is also glorification. He says, you also are to love one another. The new commandment, the new part, was in a very real sense, not just to do the same thing as Christ, as if that were possible, right? Like, for where I'm going, you cannot come. The cup I drink, you cannot drink. In the sense that they couldn't die in glory to save. But even more than just loving in a way that looks like, he was saying the love you will have for one another is a reflection not of your love, but of my love. It was a reflection of his death that is glory that reveals the Father. It wasn't just going to be kind of love that any Jill or Joe Schmo could replicate as if like willing oneself to being or acting loving in a way that looks like and maybe even can be called mirroring Christ as if that's all that matters, right? Like we've all done that. We've all willed ourselves to do things that looked like that. But this was deeper. This was more radical. This was new. Because he's saying, not that we can love like him, but that we can only truly love if done through him. Empowered from him. In a way that is the Father's perfect love and character and nature demonstrated through the glory that is the cross. You see, friends, when we die like Jesus, we don't actually extend our love to one another. When you follow Jesus and you love, it's His love you're giving. We'll come back to this at the end. Because I can feel about half of you going, not quite tracking, don't yet agree. We'll come back. It'll make sense soon. I'm hoping. <laughs> Keep reading verse 35. 
He says, by this, and at this point he means a lot of things, but he's, he's saying, by a death to self that results in life, which again, you and I cannot do without Christ, by this death that glorifies God and results in life, all people will know that you are my disciples. If you have that kind of love for one another. Well, Peter pipes up because he's like, got it, I'm tracking, I'm game. Let's all love one another. Now, I don't think he gets quite into typical Peter self-confident yet. He'll get there in a bit, but I think he's actually a little bit concerned. Look at verse 36. Simon Peter said to Jesus, Lord, where are you going? What's this place you're going to? <laughs> Can we come along? We don't want you to leave us. We certainly don't want you to die. Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I am going, you cannot follow me now. This is key. Peter, you cannot follow me to the cross now. But you will follow afterward. You can't follow now. Because I'm what, about to do, what I'm about to do, you cannot do. I'm the only one that can do that. But in a very real sense, you will follow afterward. You cannot drink the cup I drink, but you will drink of the cup that I drink. He is speaking prophetically here, not just about Peter, who, by the way, was, tradition has it, martyred on a cross upside down because he thought it was too much like Jesus to be killed right side up as Jesus. He's not just speaking prophetically about Peter, but he's speaking about all disciples who would actually follow him and who would be known by the world, by others, as having love that doesn't just look like the cross, but love because we've experienced the grace and mercy of the cross extends the cross. They would indeed follow him onto a cross on which each of them would die to self daily so that the world would see the glory of Christ in them and that was lived as his love through them. You see, your love, my love, your grace, my mercy, categorically different than the love, mercy, and grace that comes from God. You cannot but love conditionally. Oh, I'm not saying all of your love is conditional. I'm not saying you are entirely, abjectly untrue in your love and mercy and grace. I'm saying when it's love and when it's mercy and when it's grace, it's from him. Well, Peter bucks up against this. He's not sure about all this. And his self-confidence gets the better of him, which is part of why I like him. Verse 37, Peter says this, Lord... Why can I not follow you now? You're going now. We want to go now. We're ready to go now. I will lay down my life for you. Bring it, Jesus. <laughs> Which sounds great. But Jesus takes it as a bit of a rebuke from Peter. He's using Jesus' own words of departing now and he's saying, well, why can't, why can't I also depart now? Dude, Jesus, I will lay down my life for you. I suspect he didn't use the word dude. But that's kind of how I like to think about how Peter spoke willingly. He just says stuff because he was ready. He was willing. But one of the most important points that we see here from Jesus is all the willingness in the world doesn't make you able to die like Jesus. It didn't make Peter able to die like Jesus. And his rank willingness that came from him 
obscured his ability to see Jesus rightly here. It was his own attempt to stop Jesus from leaving, which from other places in the Gospels, like Mark 8.33, was Peter trying to stop him. Peter is not cool with Jesus leaving and being glorified with all this death talk. So Jesus responds with a question that not only denounces Peter's suggestion that he not leave and that he not die, but that, and this is a key point, his question also offered proof of the necessity of him dying to bring God and Peter himself in right relationship. The proof of the necessity of Jesus going to the cross was Peter's own lack of faith. Look at verse 38. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me, Peter? Now, very important thing in the text. We spoke earlier about John putting something at the beginning of the sentence. And I don't know of any of our English versions that do this well. John actually puts your life at the front of the sentence. He puts your life at the front of the sentence to emphasize how Jesus said it and meant it. (laughs) Your life, Peter? Your life? Will you indeed lay it down for me? How's that going to work? How's that going to help me? How's that going to help anybody? How's that going to help you, Peter? If you truly believe that I am the Messiah, sent from God the Father, perfect and sinless, to live what you couldn't and die so that you can have life, what good is your life going to do for me? For anybody. For you. Your life, Peter. Truly, I say to you, your life? The rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. Jesus says to Peter, indeed you will die. Indeed you will follow. But not before you have denied me and shown your faithlessness and demonstrated that it was indeed and will only indeed be my life, Jesus speaking, that can glorify the Father and bring you life. Think of it. Peter will not only fail to offer his life on behalf of Jesus, but he will soon do the exact opposite and give up Jesus to save his own. I, I, don't, I don't know the man. Jesus' question here, his words here, must have hit Peter hard because we don't hear one word from Peter until chapter 18, which is a long time for that guy. The only way that Peter or any one of us can truly follow Christ and truly love like Christ is through the cross that he called glory because though it looks like failure, it is actually death to self. It is God dying to himself that displays his perfect character and nature that John and Jesus call glory. Friends, the Bible tells us that God is love. God equals love by definition. And it says that everyone who loves is born of God. The only way we love is from the ground of God's glory expressed in Christ and achieved by Christ. You see, just like Peter, we cannot properly follow Christ, or love like Christ, until we see the cross of glory. The love of Christ that is grounded in His work of grace to give us the glory we don't deserve and couldn't earn, that is the filter for how to love and be loved. Think of it like this, if, if what we receive from God in Jesus is love we don't deserve and that we do not earn, then the love we extend to others for it to be love and grace and mercy isn't ours. It's His. 
It must be done from the grace and mercy of God in Christ, which is not the same as loving from grace and mercy that comes from you. Let's be real. I don't want your grace and mercy. I don't want you giving me grace and mercy because that's not going to get either of us very far. Like Jesus said to Peter here, your life, your love, that's not going to cut it. I want actual grace and mercy that comes from the glory of a God whose love looks like a perfect sacrifice that brings the sinner glory and grace and mercy that come from no sinner but from God alone. Otherwise, as Paul says, we are lost forever in our trespasses and sins. Friends, to come to Jesus is to realize with Peter from the end of chapter 13 all the way through 18 that being right with God is saying, yes, please, Jesus, go to the cross for me. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are grateful that you be see beyond our attempts to achieve for ourselves grace, mercy, and love that conditionally take us nowhere when it comes to a relationship with you. And that are when we extend it to others, giving others a sense of a relationship with you that can be achieved and earned. Father, forgive us for that. Help us to see that indeed what we need is the fullness of the perfect life of a sinless sacrifice where you die to bring yourself and to extend to us glory that actually works because his death atoned, his perfect sin, this life was sacrifice. So help us, Lord, not to step in the way and to hinder the movement of us living from and loving through and extending grace that comes from the ground of your work and not ours. Make of us, Lord, a people who love one another like you loved us because it comes from you. Help us to revel in that amazing truth that brings life. We ask this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen.